I'm and uh, thank you once again, church, for the opportunity that you've given me to present the Word of God this morning time. As I was uh, asking the Lord what I need to preach today, the Lord said, we have a foundation problem in most of our lives, including mine. So this topic is, where is your foundation built on this morning time? Before that, I want you to take a look at a video that I'm going to show you. This incident happened in July 25th, 2018. It's a four-story apartment um, in Turkey where there were a lot of residents. And uh, look what happened to that uh, apartment complex. Uh, Building engineers, take a note of this. I'm sure you can see what the problem is. Uh, The city did allow this by bribing and a lot of... All right. All right. Do you see what was wrong with that video? What's something that was missing at least from that corner? A deep foundation. You know where the tallest building in the world is? What's the tallest building in the world? Burj Khalifa. Okay, good. So what is the deepest foundation or structure in the world? It's a Twin Towers in Kuala Lumpur. So as high as you go, you're theoretically supposed to build as deep. If not, when the winds and the issues and something comes, you'll easily get toppled over. So the tallest building in the world is Burj Khalifa, but it does not have the deepest foundation. I don't know why. It is the engineer's decision to do it. Only time will tell if such a structure lives through. But the Twin Towers in Malaysia has the deepest foundation. Um, It's recorded as 400 feet deep so deep that they just did this as bulletproof measure even for all the storms that they're ever going to withstand. I sometimes wonder only if these engineers read what my master had to say in Matthew 7, 24 to 7 and Luke 6, 46 to 49. These two stories are very parallel to each other, except there are very few differences that will make us think. Okay, so a wise man built his honor rock a wise man build this but that's the storm that we get from matthew luke does not have that in luke it's addressing a very important problem that is there was a man who built a house on a foundation and there was a person who did not build on a foundation so in luke the story is about a foundation versus no foundation and in matthew the story is about where the foundation was whether it was on the top soil or if it was on the rock. When Jesus said this parable, there's a context to this. Prophetic context and immediate context. The prophetic context actually comes from Isaiah 28, verses 16. It says, Therefore thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am the one who has laid as a foundation in Zion, a stone, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone of a sure foundation. Whoever believes will not be in haste. This is talking about Messiah, Jesus Christ. He was tested three and a half years. He was tested, he was tried, and God's prophetic fulfillment happened that whoever believes in Jesus shall not perish. Clearly, the people at that time didn't get this idea. They didn't understand that now. How blessed are we to actually read this and make connection, amen? I am always excited to be as a New Testament believer because we get to see the fulfillment of the promises, which makes us want to believe more and more about what our God has said for us in the future. Amen? Amen. Praise God. So anything that we build today, it only, uh, what is the house construction um, average months? It's about seven to eight months here, okay, in America. We can quickly make a house. You've seen it, right? But back in the day, in Israel, Palestinian, Jesus times, time frame, it took several months of planning, preparation, the rain affected it, the winds affected it, the soil affected it, a lot of ish things affected it. So in order for an average common person, like me, to build a house, I would first need to dig around the area that I need to build a house. And usually, houses are only built on summer days. It's because it's warm, hot the air is dry but not in the winter days because it would rain in jerusalem israel palestine time when we say winter it's our winter months okay sometimes it does snow but in typical uh building uh, the, uh in the th- building uh 
codes, you're supposed to build it in summer. So an average person would build his house in the summer. He would take a big pick and start digging the ground. The problem with this is the fact that the topsoil becomes so hard because it's hardened clay. So for an average person at that day, in a hot, sunny day, you are picking through the ground. You are theoretically supposed to hit the bedrock and you're supposed to keep digging and digging and digging until it's bedrock. Only then can you build a structure up. But because it's so hot, it's so painful, it's tiresome, and the soil almost feels solid because it's clay, this average person doesn't get that. But he, all he understands is, hey, it's firm enough. My pick isn't going through. It's good. It's good enough, solid enough. So the clay becomes very hard. For him, that's okay. And then he starts building a house. Because think about it. Back in the day, they don't have bulldozers, power tools, nothing that to quickly dig through the things. So this common man will build his house, quickly put up a roof, all before the winter hits because what's going to happen soon? Rain's going to happen. When the rain comes... Typically, the waters usually go away, created channels, but sometimes a flash flooding event happens. We all get alerts and news on our phone every other day in Oklahoma at this point. Flash flooding, flash flooding. And for us, we're okay. We know, hey, we have a solid foundation. We have storm shelters. Don't care. Whatever comes, we are good. But for this man, his work will be tested that day when that flash flood happens. And when that day if his foundation was not all the way to the bedrock, his house will fall and he'll forever be in shame. It's a financial loss for this man. So it's in this context, Jesus is giving a parable. But Jesus did not give this parable immediately in his service. He actually laid down what kind of principles he wanted the people to follow. In each one of our lives, the principles that we study and follow will become the foundation on which we build our lives. This is why we see some people really hopeless and really do, do crazy things in the world. And you're like, how can they even do such things? How can they think like that? Because they don't have a proper principle on which they have built their foundation. So Jesus, even before saying this story about a wise man and a foolish man, he went through the list of new principles that he's giving to the New Testament believer. And this morning time, I want you to pay close attention when Jesus says, not only be the listeners of my story, but you're only wise if you do it. Be very careful this morning time. You and I might be reading the Bible 24-7. There's a lot of people that I've seen that brag. I read the Bible back to back and not a single one of that is applied in their lives. Jesus says you're foolish. Jesus laid down almost 17 to 18 principles of building a foundation on Christ on a foundation that was prophesied years ago. The first thing, he started by talking about the Beatitudes. We all know it. But it's a new teaching. Back in Jesus' days, the poor are not blessed. Those who mourn are not comforted. Those who are meek is not a good thing. Those who hunger for thirst and righteousness, they were considered the weak of the society. But Jesus is saying, blessed are those who are merciful. Blessed are those who are pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the persecutor. Jesus is coming and erasing the worldly principles and he's giving a new principles on which his disciples need to lay their foundation on. This morning time, as we go through these 17 to 18 principles, I want you and I to check, have we built our foundation on these principles or are we like the world? Because when time comes, you will be tested. When time comes, God will actually test if you're listening and doing what the word says versus just coming and attending the services. The second principle God said, okay, salt and the light. He gave a story about salt and light. But he basically was saying, you are an important person in, our, in this world. Look at the suicide rates. It's climbing every day. Why? People are hopeless. They have no point in living, even Christians and non-Christians alike. But Jesus says, dear brother, dear sister, dear child of God, you are the salt and the light of the earth. You matter. What you say, what you do, what you behave, what you wear, how you speak to others, people are watching you. This is the principle on which you have to build your life. Dear young man and woman of God, when you're in college, when you are at your dorms, wherever you are, people are watching you whether you want to believe it or not. Just because your name is Christian does not mean they assume that you're a Christian. Live by the example that Christ has taught you. You are the salt and light that other people need to taste and see. B 
Be careful. All right. The third principle is Jesus said, I have come to fulfill in the Old Testament law. Recently, we have heard a lot of liberal theology where it says, God is done with the Old Testament. You don't have to worry about it. We are in the new era. God loves everybody. Continue going on sin. We are in grace theology. Dear child of God, when you go to college, you're going to hear this. You will see a lot of gay pastors. You will see a lot of gay churches. We actually see a huge split in the Lutheran churches. They said the God of the Old Testament is not as harsh as the God of the New Testament. They said Jesus did not mention about the Old Testament as condemning against homosexuals. Matter of fact, he embraced them in the New Testament. But here, God, Jesus is giving a principle. I have not eradicated all any of the Old Testament. I came to fulfill it. So do not be deceived, dear child of God, when somebody says you God is done with the Old Testament. You don't have to listen to it. It is applicable to you and I. Jesus has said it. That's the third principle that God has said. So this morning time, do not believe when your friends, when your college professors, when your social media says we have to agree to everything that's going on today because Old Testament doesn't matter. No, no, it does matter. My Jesus said it. And you want to follow him because he has a firm foundation that is tested and tried. Here's the fourth principle, anger. You can be angry, but make sure that you don't sin. That is the new concept that Jesus was introducing. And on top of that, Jesus is saying, make sure you reconcile with your brother that you just got angry with before coming and worshiping. So this morning time, are you applying that principle in your life? Did you just fight with somebody in the morning with bitterness, with anger, and you're coming and lifting your... By the way, the message talks to me. When I point at you, three points back to me. If you live your life this carefully, hey, the next time you're arguing with your dad, your mom, your brother, your sister, your pastor, you have to be pricked. Can I raise my holy hands and praise the God? The hands that I used to beat my wife, my husband, the words that I used, the lips that I used to curse at my children. Can I come to this Sunday service and lift up the holy name of Jesus? This is one of the foundational principle. If you cannot do this, you're a foolish man according to the Bible. You're just doing a lip service in the presence of God. Here's the next principle. Adultery. Up until that day, everybody can commit adultery just like in the secret banks, right? With, the, with your thoughts, everybody could do it. But Jesus comes and says, stop. The next time you look at any woman with the lust, you have committed adultery. Wow, that's a new teaching. Unheard of. As a Christian believer, God has given you new standards. The standards that God has given you is not of cheap. It's of high excellence. So when you go to college, when you go to any place, whether you watch something online in your secret rooms, in your imagination, the Lord knows your thoughts and your imaginations. And God has saying, I've seen it and it is a sin into thy presence. So dear young man and woman of God, you think your parents might not see it? Clearly you can clear your web browsing history, but the Lord says your thought, the very thought when that girl or when that man walked by you, He's counting it, and if it's sinful, he will hold you accountable for it. All right, here's a, new, here's a new bar that Jesus sets for divorce. Jesus says, you cannot divorce people like you're changing clothes. We see that today. Matter of fact, today a lot of people don't get married because they don't want to deal with the consequence of divorce because financially it's too much. Jesus made a new principle saying that unless it's the cost of sexual morality, you cannot divorce your wife, period, the end. Can you live by that principle? Or are you trying to twist it? Because Jesus is not twisting his words. He means what he means. So it's not up to us to change what the principles have been laid down in the scripture. Here's another one. He said, Jesus said, keep your word. If you're saying yes, say yes. If you're saying no, say no. Take oaths in a proper manner. When you say that you will do something for the church, do it. When you said that you will pray for that believer, pray for the believer. Don't give a lip service by saying, I'll pray for you, believer, and never forget about him. This is a principle. This is a foundation on which you're supposed to lay this. Are you and I doing this? Jesus gave all these principles and then he gave the story of the wise man and the foolish man. He asked, you better be ready to listen to all these principles on which I'm laying down for you to build. Here's a new one. He said, you need to take no retaliation no more. Back in the day, it was an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Because he hurt me, I'm going to hurt him. But Jesus said, no longer. New principle, new foundation. You will forgive them and you'll pray for them. If he slaps you on your left, you're going to show the right. Don't take him to the courts for unnecessary things. Reconcile. That's what Jesus called for. That's a new principle that he gave, a new foundation. Are we doing it? 
Here's another one. Love. I know everybody talks about love. But are we actually doing it? Augustine of Hippo said this. You have enemies for who can live on this earth without them. You can't live without enemies. Take heed to yourself. Love them. In no way can your enemy so hurt you by his violence as much as you can hurt yourself if you don't love him. Meaning, you love him to a point where he realizes, why are you loving me so much? I am persecuting you. Bless those who persecute you. Jesus gave that commandment. At your workplace, is your boss torturing you? In your school, are their friends bullying you? I'm not saying take the bullying laying down. You have to ask the proper authorities. But take it to the Lord in prayer. You will see wonder-working miracles happening. Is your boss persecuting you? Is your, is your household issues not working out for you? Take it to the Lord. Don't take retaliation. He is the, Jesus gave this new principle for us, to, for us to live by. Let's follow it in the days to come. Okay, next. Jesus said giving. He said, give to the needy. I know we all give a lot, so I don't even have to. Pastor Shibu Thomas always says his church gives a lot for mission work. But if you don't, the Lord sees that too. Praying. Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Why? Because back in the day, they used to pray with long jargons. When I was young, I used to listen to the prayers of other aunties and uncles because I wanted to pray like them. They were so long. It was so nice. And then I'm like, maybe the more I add words, the more I do things, God might hear. But then I realized this Lord's prayer was simple. It asked you to pray for daily bread. It asked you to pray to forgive other people so you can be forgiven. The principle of the Lord's prayer is beautiful. No time to go into that. Okay, new principle in, in praying. Here's a new principle in fasting. Jesus was giving a new spiritual discipline this morning time. I want to ask you as a brother and sister in Christ, do you have a spiritual discipline? It's a huge topic of its own. Do you fast? I'm asking that to myself too. When's the last time you and I fasted? Young people, older generation, I know you guys did it. I mean, that's why we are here. We see the benefit. Young children, our parents fasted and the Lord counted that as a blessing to them and we are reaping the benefits. The question is, what are we doing for our children? Are we having a proper spiritual discipline like our parents did? Ask yourself this question. Here's another one. Jesus says, don't be anxious. When's the last time somebody said, don't be anxious? Tell yourself this morning time. Turn around to somebody and says, do not be anxious for the Lord cares for you. The next time you are worried about something, when you're in school, when you're in work, and you're like, I don't know what to do about it. Jesus gave you a new principle. He said, do not be anxious. Do not be anxious. What a comforting word from the master, the creator of the world, the creator of your life, your future, the alpha, the omega, the first and last is saying, don't worry, I got you. But he gave a clause saying, seek ye first the kingdom of God. Make sure you seek him. Seek ye first. Then it will all be added unto you. Then he gave you a new golden rule in Matthew 7, 12. New principle. He said, whatever you wish to others to do for you, you do to them. So the next time you're treating a patient, you would treat it like as if you want to be treated to you. The next time if you're a car mechanic, repair that person's car just as if you want your own car to be repaired. The next time you do customer service, do it just like how you want it, somebody done to you. This is a principle. We as Christians need to live by it. This is the new foundation that has been given to us. Okay, coming back to all of this. After giving all these principles and foundations, Jesus then gives a story about the wise man and the foolish man. The wise man and the foolish man. So the first words in Luke 6, 46 again, it says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not what I tell you? For everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show you what he's like. This morning time, I want to ask yourself, you have attended so many services from childhood. You have heard so many sermons and so many preaching about all these beatitudes and principles of life. The question to you this morning time is, are you following it? Are you making that applicable to your life? If not, including myself, Jesus says, I'm foolish. I'm just building a huge house of spirituality for other people to see. One day when troubles hit, it'll fall down and it'll be a great fall. This morning time, evaluate your spiritual life. Evaluate your physical work life, school life. Where is your foundation built upon? See, listening and doing is compared to being a wise man. Why? Because you're wise. You listen to the words of Jesus and he's wise. Second thing, you're a blessed man. 
Listening and doing what the word says. You're a blessed man. Psalms 1 verses 1 to 12. Blessed is the man who walks. Don't just read it, apply it. You're a blessed man. The Bible calls you to be blessed. But if you don't listen, you're a foolish man. You're a deceived man. You're like Adam. Adam heard the word from God. And yet he could not apply that into his life when his wife brought that opinion to him. Don't be like the foolish man. Do not be deceived. The word that you receive from the Lord, whether in your meditation or through messages, apply it in your lives. Why do you want to listen and do what God says? You'll be firm in the storm. Look at Job's life. Such a catastrophic event all of a sudden. When you and I are thinking our finances are going good, marriage is going great, kids are in college. I promise you when the catastrophic event happens, only those who listen and apply the word can stay firm. Only then can you be like the Job and says, even when my flesh fails, I will see the Lord in his glory. Amen. If you do not apply what the Bible tells you, you will be distraught in the storm. Look at the disciples. We see that story, right? When the storms came all of a sudden, they said, Master, do you not care? This is where most people become atheists or leave God and saying, you know, if God loved me, he would have never let me have happen to all this, my health, my wealth. Dear brothers and sisters, make sure whatever you read and listen, you apply so that you will withstand the storm. Finally, Those who listen to the word and apply it in their life, they will receive eternal, eternal crown of life. James 1 verses 12, it says, Blessed is a man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those. And if not, in Luke 8 verses 19, and nor anything may be manifest, nor anything in secret will be known and come to light at the end of the day. When you listen and do God's work, you will receive the crown of life. You will withstand the trials and temptations. So anything that you do in college and workplaces, it matters to your child of God. If you think nobody's watching you, I want to let you know that every word that you say and everything that you read in the Bible, you listen and if you don't apply it, you will be for eternal shame and there's no comeback from it. Eternity, there's no comeback or second chances. What you do today, what you apply today, Let others see and let them glorify God. Personally, I will admit that I will have had doubts on a lot of things in my life. But I always dig deep back into the word. And as I told my Sunday school student, why do I believe what I believe? That was the question today. Why do I believe what I believe? Evidentially, factually, there is a proof that a God exists. The question is who then? We have seen way many gods out there. Jesus Muhammad, Buddha, name it. Why did I pick Jesus? Or why was my heart drawn to it? Because he kept his word when he said, I will rise on the third day. He is the only one that kept his word when he says, I am going to come back. He is the only God that said, I will carry your burdens. He is the only one that says, I care for you. There's no other God in the earth or in heaven that ever said he cares for me. Every other God, I have to offer something to make him happy. But the Lord that I serve and that I believe, he said, come to me and I will give you rest. If you are weak, if you're tired, if you're sick, if you're hungry, the Lord, the master of the world came down in human form and said, I will give you rest. Why do I believe what I believe? I believe that I'm a sinner. My sins have to be paid for somehow, somewhere. If the earthly justice system pays for what makes you pay for what you did as crimes, how much more will the creator of the earth ask you for the same? Why do I believe what I believe? Because Jesus was the only answer to the sin problem of the world. No other religion answers the sin problem. Jesus Christ, the son of God, God in flesh, took upon the iniquity that was meant for me so that I could live with them eternally. Why do I believe what I believe? He said, I will come back very soon. And when I come back, I will take you. This morning time, young child, listen to me very carefully. Your your age and your, your years in college will go by very quickly in four years or five or six or whatever. I want you to realize where is your foundation laid upon this morning time? Who are you trusting? Your friends, your words of the world or the word of God? I want you to always remember this verse. In my church, in the front podium, there's a verse that always sticks out right here. It's James 1, 21 to 25. Not that big, but basically it says, Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness. 
which is able to, uh, and receive with meekness the implanted word. Implanted word, that, me that means a lot. Implanted, it's got to be deep so it starts growing root. And receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. Dear children, dear college student, underline this. Be doers of the word and not hearers only. Deceiving yourself. You're not going to deceive your church. You won't deceive your parents. You're going to deceive yourself. You will be that foolish man who did not take time to study the word of God and build a proper solid foundation of why you believe what you believed. When your friends, when your colleges asks you a question about this, those strong storms will topple you down. Therefore, be doers of the word and not hearers only. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks himself and goes away at once. Forget what he was like. Do not forget who you are. Are you not a believer? Come to the Lord Jesus Christ this morning time. Are you a believer? Check where your foundation is and how deep you know about Jesus. Are you somebody who's a seasoned pastor? A minister? The more you go higher in the ministry, make sure your root is as deep as it gets. Because in ministry, you're going to face so many things, unpredictable things. Only a deep foundational, deep root can help you sustain. Let's close our eyes. Father God, we come before your throne of grace. God, we're examining our foundation this morning time. Lord, you gave so many principles on how our foundations need to be built. And Lord, if there's a crack, if there is a defect in our foundation, the way we thought, the way we behaved as Christians, God, you said we have to be the salt and light of the world. And at times we failed, God, in our colleges, in our workplaces. God, we really failed to represent who Christ is. Forgive us. Our words, our actions, our speech, the clothes that we wear, the songs that we listen to, the songs that we sing the parties that we attend to, the people that we hang out with, God, it did not represent you. We have a better foundation in Christ and God allow us to rebuild our foundation. And if we are weak in it, help us to restore for a stronger understanding of who you are. We love you. We bless you. Yahweh, you're lifted up. And thank you for the sacrifice that you have paid for me so that I could be redeemed and made whole in the presence of God. We surrender everything in the name of Jesus and the church said, amen, amen, amen.